Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Good morning, everyone. So excited for Mother's Day. Now, Mother's Day is like one of my favorite uh, times of year because I get to celebrate the women in my life. Like, it's amazing. Not that I don't do that, like, regularly, though. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like I just wait, like, wait for Mother's Day and wait for birthdays. That's not, like, it. But, like, Mother's Day is just, like, a special time. I just want to say happy Mother's, Mother's Day to you all. And moms are incredible. Um, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of watching Beth uh, since Jane was born. And again, again, recently, when our most recent baby was born, Marion, about eight weeks ago. I've had the opportunity to just watch her living selfless, selflessly and loving unconditionally and, and, and loving people. And it's just been an absolute honor to be able to just watch um, Beth love our kids better than I ever could, to be honest. Like, I just absolutely incredible that even when things are stacked against her, she just pushes through and she loves well, even when there's a lack of sleep. Uh, but there's always an abundance of love. And mothers are absolutely incredible. So we just want to honor you as our mothers today, those are, again, who are physical mothers as well as those who are spiritual mothers in our community and in our world. And I found some statements about motherhood this week that I want to share with you. This one is, motherhood is a fairy tale in reverse. You start in a beautiful gown and end up cleaning everyone's messes. <laughs> uh, that was so funny when I saw that. <sighs> and then there's this one. It's sad when you sit around waiting for, uh, for mom to make dinner, then you realize you are the mom, right? <laughs> It's like, where's dinner? It's like, oh yeah, I'm like, so funny. And then the next one is, I don't want to sleep like a baby. I want to sleep like my husband. <laughs> uh, that was so funny. And again, I didn't write these, but this one says, being a mom to a teenager will, teenager will make you understand why some animals eat their young. Okay, I didn't write that. I didn't, I didn't write that. I just found it, okay? But moms are absolutely incredible. So today we honor you as the mothers uh, in our house. And so we're so excited after our service. We're gonna have our ice cream social. I want to encourage you to stick around. And uh, just have some ice cream and fellowship together. And today, we're going to be concluding a series we've been going through called Back to the Basics. And it's been really good for me. I, I've been spending a lot of time um, just trying to really go back to the very, very basics of what it means for us to be the local church. I just want to give us a bit of a recap before we uh, go into our final message. So I'm just going to read through Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. It says this, all, And all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And other believers met together in one place and shared everything they had, and they sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need, and they worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. And this is the verse we're going to be spending uh, today in, and it says this, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. This last statement is really what we're going to be talking about, but it's, and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. And so if we want to go back to the very basics of what the church um, is designed to be, um, the basic devotion, right, it says they devoted themselves of the church should be to teaching, fellowship, and prayer. And the basic power of the church uh, should, should be signs and wonders, God actually moving in a miraculous way. And the, our, the basic posture of a church should be generosity, walking in generosity in every aspect of who we are, that we're just so generous with our time and our money and all of it to be able to be a blessing wherever we go. And the basic focus of the church should be true worship, right? Worshiping our God. And again, we're gonna conclude this series today with that final verse. I'm gonna read it one more time. It says, and all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. And I love how this part ends, right? This is the end of Acts chapter two. This is the last thing it says. It says, and the, each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. It's like the fruit of everything else talked about is this final moment of, of God actually reaching people and people actually coming to know Jesus through this fellowship, through this community. And so the, one of the questions I wanna ask um, and we wanna go through is this question is, is the church supposed to grow? It's a question that is actually debated. Uh, 
among some people, whether the church is supposed to grow. And I'm just not, I'm not talking about like known victory church. I'm just talking like globally about is the church supposed to go? And I think this is a great question. However, I truly believe that the Bible is very clear on the building of the church, that the church is supposed to be growing. And we see this very clearly in a conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. And it's in Matthew chapter 16. So if you have a Bible, you can go with me. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 20. And it says this. And when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, why do people say that the son, who do the people say the son of man is? Now, when Jesus asks you a question, if you read through, there's a lot of questions that come up that Jesus asking people, but who do people say the son of man is? Who do people say I am? Well, (laughs) they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then he asked them, who do you say I am? Or not, who do they say I am? Who do you say I am? That's a very important question. And Simon Peter answered. This is so powerful. He said, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Other translations say the gates of hell will not, will not overcome it. It says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So we see this moment, Jesus is having this conversation with his disciples. Who do you say I am? And Peter, he says, you are the Messiah, the son of God, right? A very powerful statement, really the first moment that someone actually vocalizes what they're actually seeing. On this, and then he says, on this rock, I will build my church. The, re, the church is built on the reality that Jesus is our Messiah, that he's the son of the living God. That's the foundation of what the church is. It's built on the Jesus being who he says he is and that he came back from the dead. This is this moment where Jesus says, my, my church will be built. And nothing can come against it. So I believe that God is building his church today just as he was all those years ago. God is building his church. And I truly believe that that, that God wants to do something powerful in, in the next couple of years. You know, in part of our church, but also just globally, that if we do devote ourselves to the teaching and to prayer and we devote ourselves to generosity and we, we follow what God has called us to do as the church, I believe that we're going to start to see many people come to know Jesus and give their lives to him because God is building his church. I believe God's heart is to build the church. That even when the world is against us, even when our circumstance is against us, that our faces are drawn to him as we go to him in worship and we worship him as our king and as our Lord, we worship the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And I believe God loves his church so much. That God loves the church so much. And I think that in response, we need to love the church as well. The bride of Christ, as, as, it's gone, as it's said in the New Testament, that we need to love the church as well. <clears throat> so I believe that sh- the church should grow. The next question I want to ask, ask is, how should the church grow? This is another great question. How? Well, number one is it says there, it says each day, right? If we go back to the verse, it says, and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. So what's, what this means is that, that, that the growth of the church is supposed to be consistent. Those who are giving their lives to Jesus and getting baptized, like it's supposed to be consistent. The Lord added to their numbers each and every day. Yet if we look at the statistics in North America, we actually they see that the church is shrinking. Especially within the next generation. We're seeing this as a thing happening within North America, even across our world, people leaving the church at a very extraordinary rate. And it's very fascinating that we see this happening. But I just want to go back to really the basics of, you know, all of us, I think we have to be excited about what God is doing in his church. 
and that we share the beauty. We share the, the beauty of who he is and we go and we, we share the stories. We share our stories of what God has done in our life and we can start to see the next generation come back to following Jesus again like they used to. God is building his church and it's supposed to be consistent. Because even in Acts chapter nine, verse 31, it says this. It says, the church then had peace throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria. And it became stronger as the believers lived in fear of the Lord. And with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. We see, if you read through Acts, we see moment after moment of the church growing very quickly. It says, it says that when, when Peter gave the first message after, after they received the Holy Spirit, 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus in a moment. We see story after story of growth. But do you know what you also see when the church is growing? A lot of horrible things can happen. And what I mean by this is if you read through Acts, not only did it shift what was happening in people's hearts, it shifted what was happening in the land. It didn't just affect what was happening in the church. In fact, they were having meetings being like, what do we do about these crazy followers of Jesus? What do we do? You know, there's times where the, where, where the disciples would go and they'd, they'd heal somebody and the people would just be silent because they're like, we don't even know what to say. We don't even know what to do. In fact, a lot of the disciples ended up going to prison and, and being martyred for their faith. And we see all these things happening. But in the midst of all that chaos and all that pain and all of it, the church was growing faster than ever. The church is supposed to be growing. Because again, the church at that time was affecting more than just each other's lives. It was affecting every aspect of society was happening because people were giving their lives to Jesus. All of a sudden, people were being generous. All of a sudden, we're seeing people, you know, walking that couldn't walk and we're seeing all these miraculous things taking place and it actually changed the society. They didn't know what to do with them because for them, the mission of spreading the gospel was more important than their own livelihood and safety. The mission of sharing Jesus was more important. It was the most important thing in their life. That they gave up, they gave up everything in order to share Jesus with people. You know, we have gotten so used to comfort in our lives. Comfort has become really the thing we seek. We just want to be comfortable. And anything that's not comfortable scares us. And you know how comfortable we've gotten? I think, I think this is fascinating. They say right now that the average attention span of a human being is 8.25 seconds. Do you know what's funny is a goldfish is nine seconds. That means in our lives, we have less attention span than a goldfish. Why? Think about this. How quickly, I mean, back in my day, we didn't even have a remote for the TV. You know what I'm talking about? But it's like, oh, I don't like this. We just change it immediately. We saw this with our daughter. She, we, she had an iPad for a while. She doesn't have an iPad anymore. Because what would happen is we'd see her and literally every three seconds clicking on a new video. It's destroying our brains. Our attention spans are so poor. Why? Because we always want things immediately. I remember one time I ordered an Amazon package that said it was going to come Friday. It came Saturday. I almost sent in a complaint. And you know what I'm talking about because you're like feeling the same way. It's like, it says it's going to be here by nine. You keep checking it every five seconds. Where is it? It's like, relax for like a moment. We want to be so comfortable. We want everything to be so instant that a lot of us, we've actually given up the mission of sharing Jesus because we just want to make sure that everything that we're doing, okay. We're like, it's like, Jesus is so much more important than anything else. We need to dedicate our lives to sharing his love. We get so caught up in trying to make our lives easier that we miss out on the adventure that life is supposed to be. We miss out on the moments. I think, how, many, how much time am I wasting with my little children because I'm so distracted? And I'm not spending time in moments of, of love with my kids all the time. I'm just wasting so much time on the wrong things. We talked about this even last week. We're supposed to, the church is supposed to be growing. The basic premise is that Jesus is supposed to be spread across the land. And then in the verse it keeps going, it says, and then the Lord added 
And again, this is where we get this, this thought of addition and growth. The church is supposed to grow and God cares about the church so much. And in fact, the church is often referred to as the bride of Christ, right? And that's a pretty important and intimate relationship that is referred to. And Ephesians 5, 25 says this, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean and washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. This is how much God loves the church. This is how much God loves you and I. He gave up his life. He sacrificed everything. And I think, again, I've been in church my whole life. Some of us, we haven't been in church very long. Some of us have been in church for a long time. I think sometimes we, we just take for granted so much what God actually did for us. Because we've been living in it for so long. You get so comfortable even in just in that that we kind of forget. It's like, it's so important and so vast and so beautiful. Don't ever forget. Jesus gave it all for the church, everything, himself. And I believe that's not just, just for you and for me. That's for the people in this world who desperately need love and desperately need peace and desperately need joy. And so I think our response, at least for me, is to give my life to serving God's church, to serving the people that come around us. And I don't mean just for our church. I mean for everyone. It doesn't matter what people believe. It doesn't matter what they think. It doesn't matter who they vote for. What matters is that as believers, our responsibility is to love people deeply. And I know I've been around people my whole life. Loving people can be so hard, like extremely hard. Or if someone posts something on Facebook and you're like, I have to respond to this. That is a horrible opinion. And then you see these debates taking place. And sometimes it's between family members fighting. Let us learn to love each other better. To give up our lives for one another. To be generous with one another. And the next question I want to go through is this, is what's the point, right? That's a big question, another great question. What's the point of growth? Is the point of growth to have better production or have better technology? No. Is it to build our self-esteem as leaders? No. Is it to create a platform to share our thoughts and our opinions? It's not. These are the reasons, according to Acts 2, why the point, the point of why the church is supposed to go. Number one is fellowship. Community is so important. I think I talk about this a lot, like probably weekly, how important it is, connection and community. But why I talk about it is because right now we're living in one of the loneliest and isolated societies in human history. The technology that was supposed to bring us together has actually drove us apart. It's tearing apart relationships. And why do we need community? Because it pushes against the norm of society. Everyone needs connection. If you read through scripture, you see story after story of people living in community and conquering things they never could have done on their own. Right? Adam needed Eve. Elijah needed Elisha. You know, David needed Jonathan. Jesus needed his disciples. Paul needed Timothy, and I need Beth. Because I can't, I can't go through life on my own. You know, when I get to Mother's Day, you know what I think about? This is just for me. I think about all the people who are going through life as a single parent, right? Like, I think about Beth and I, how hard it is to raise two kids, two of us, with one person trying to raise two kids working and 
I just think about, man, we need each other so badly. We need one another. We think we can do it on our own. You know, society says, you know, build yourself up and create your following and create your wealth, whatever. It's like, bring somebody alongside you. Bring someone else to love. God uses the church to sharpen one another, to love one another, to care for one another, to correct one another, to do life with one another. To bear each other's burdens, to encourage one another, to cry together, to mourn together, to to celebrate, to rejoice together, to eat together, to fast together. Yet for a lot of us, the, the, the thought of inviting someone into our home or into our lives, or inviting someone into our church scares us. You know, what's happened in our society, in our culture, is what we do is we buy homes, we put up fences, we park in our garage, and we don't even sometimes interact with our neighbors that live literally. Sometimes it feels like centimeters away from us. We don't even know some of their names. You know, years and years ago, that wasn't the case. Communities would come together and you'd have meals together and celebrate birthdays together. Nowadays, we're just trying to be so private and we're we're trying to hide ourselves from each other. Let us learn to invite people into our life. Like, what if I invite someone to my home? What if it's different? Like, what if it's, what if they act weird? What if my kids are acting weird? What if they don't like, what if they don't like it? What if our pastor says something super weird? What if my kids act out of turn? What if my kids tell them what I said to them last night? I can't let anyone into my space because then I won't have my space anymore. You know, you might, we might even say, I can't invite someone to church. That's for the evangelist. You know, our world needs fellowship and needs community. And if you notice this, they will find it in the wrong places and we will as well. You see communities, right? You've seen this happening all over culture. Communities are forming. Communities that gather people with similar struggles and similar identities and similar beliefs, similar tastes in music or sports. And we're seeing this right now in Edmonton, right? How many of y'all have been paying attention to the Edmonton Oilers? What a roller coaster. It's like, wow, they're so good. They scored five goals. Next game, it's like, can you just get a shot? Right? Like, I'm not going to be the only one. Like, I don't even want to talk to you that much, but I'm like, like I'm, a, I'm an emotional mess. <laughs> but sports has this ability to bring people together, right? There's something unique, and I lived in Calgary for most of my life. And Calgary didn't make the playoffs a lot. Neither did Edmonton, let's just be honest, right? But there's something powerful, Bo, and something brings culture and brings people together to celebrate one common goal, right? And we're seeing this in Edmonton right now. Have you ever seen what's happening, like, called the moss pit? Not saying it's, like, a great place to go, right? I'm not saying that. Like, there's been some wild stories coming out what's happening, okay? But people are going together, and they're so excited about hockey in our city, and, and, and I'm enjoying being a part of this. But I think that some of us were more excited about hockey than we are about what God is doing. We're more willing to talk about how the Oilers are doing and how, how dry saddles breaking all the records. It's like, what about Jesus? What if we had the same excitement that we had about sports, that we had about our God? Like, what if? I think it's time for the church to just go back to the basics of building our community around Jesus. The one who was raised from the dead on the third day. The most exciting news we could ever receive. That Jesus is alive and we have been resurrected with him and we've been given new and abundant life. Community and fellowship is so important. We've got to be excited about what God is doing. And then the second reason why the church should grow, I believe, and this is what it says. It says, the Lord added to their fellowship every day those who were being saved. And so the second reason is saved, which also just really means just life change and an opportunity to people to give their lives to Jesus. That's why we grow. That's why we want to share the gospel. It's not to just fill the chairs. Like, no, it's about 
getting people into real relationship with Jesus. The church is designed to give a gl- people a glimpse of the goodness of God. God is the one that brings life change to people. People turning from their old ways and making Jesus their leader. I'm gonna invite Mariah up to come play the piano. To bring deep and true life change. And I think a lot of us in this place today, we've experienced this, the goodness of God. Maybe some of us, we haven't yet experienced it. You know, I think all of us, we have a story and I haven't shared you know, all of my story But as, you know, I grew up in the church and what, again, what we're seeing is a lot of people when they graduate, I think the statistic is like 80% of people, as soon as they graduate high school, those in the church, they leave. Like 80%. You know, and I, I, you know I'm young, but God has radically changed my life. Like radically. Again, we all have a story. When I was, you know, I think it was 2004, when I was young, my dad went to Las Vegas for, for a business trip, his plan was to be there for 24 hours because he hates the city. Not a big fan of Las Vegas. I get it, right? The Golden Knights are there. You know? That trip ended up being weeks. You know, my dad was uh, trying to get some ice cream and tried to run across. He got hit by a taxi, 80 kilometers an hour. I remember I was at my friend's house. We were. It was in November, and we were we were sledding, and all of a sudden, uh, his mom comes and like grabs us from the hill and drives me home and I get home and my grandparents are there and my mom's bags are packed she's like I gotta go and I, I didn't even really get to say but like bye to my mom like it was super quick because she had to get to the airport to fly to Las Vegas and I remember in that moment being like God like will I see my dad again right that's a thought I think all of us we have like when you have these hard moments which you all do and my, my dad ended up surviving this accident which is a miracle he ended up coming home just before Christmas uh, in 2000, and I believe it was 2003, 2004, one of those years. You know, and from that moment, you know, life, life really changed for all of us. And, you know, my parents later, they got separated and divorced like a lot of, you know, parents do. And I remember there's just all these questions in my mind. And I think all of us, we've had moments where we ask these questions like, God, where are you, right? Like, really, like, you know, maybe we've been in church a long time. There's still moments where I'm like, God, like, where are you? Where are you when I'm feeling so broken and when I'm feeling so lost? And where are you? And you know what's so powerful, and I'll never forget it, is when all these things were going on, my church was always there for me. And always there for my mom, and always there for my family. You know, the church. Yes, the church isn't perfect, right? Like we're a bunch of broken, often immature humans trying to make it through life. We're all just broken people, but I think some of us, maybe we've been hurt by the church and maybe even me as your pastor, maybe, you know, I've, I've hurt you in some way. I'm not perfect. But I want to encourage you, let's be there for each other. Like really the church, like let's grow together in, in fellowship and share our stories and love one another because we all need community. You know, the church is supposed to grow. You know, the church also isn't exclusive, right? It's, a, it's not a place where just the VIPs come in, you know? It's just us broken people. You know, our takeaway today is this is the church is designed for the ordinary to come together and build the extraordinary, right? It's ordinary people coming together to around one purpose, Jesus, to build the extraordinary and worship and signs and wonders and fellowship, community. You know, I believe that God is calling us as a church into a season of growth. I truly believe this. A season where we will see people giving their lives to Jesus in a powerful way. A season where we are seeing people getting baptized and 
leaving their past and clinging to Jesus as their future. I truly believe this. This is what I'm seeing as our pastor. A season where we see signs and wonders and we, we're, we're worshiping in spirit and in truth and God is gonna move mightily. I believe this. And you know what I'm excited about is he's moving. Do you know what that means? We gotta move too. Like we gotta go with him, cling on to him. Sometimes you feel like you're clinging to God for dear life, right? You're like, God, like this is like wild. But let's cling to him and move wherever he goes. You know, we pursue growth not so we can fill some seats. But we pursue growth, why? So we can fill heaven and rob hell. That's why. It's not about our egos. It's, it's, just, it's like we should have to have this desperate cry and desperate love for our city. Our city needs Jesus. We share the message of Jesus because we want the greatest news that has ever hit our world to be spread across the land. We want to see people's lives changed. You know what we want to see? You know what I want to see? I want to see addiction cease in people's lives. I want to see fear vanish. I want to see anger disappear. I want to see relationships restored. I want to see love prevail. I want to see peace reign. I want to see joy conquer. That's what I want to see. For this love to spread. And you know, as I've been, you know, as I've been praying and as I've had people talking to me and encouraging me, you know, a lot of the time they're saying, just wait. Something's about to break open for our church. I don't know exactly what that means, but I believe God's about to do something powerful in our midst. And I wanna encourage you to think of someone that maybe you wanna invite into our community. Maybe we have some, maybe it's a neighbor or a coworker, I don't know, but have people to invite, to have a place to belong, a place to find friends, a place to find healing. Think of somebody. You know, the basic design of the church is to be a community that worships freely and loves well. So as we close that, I just want to encourage you to stand. I'm just going to pray for us as a church. You know, we don't kind of do this very often, but I just want to pray for our church as we step into the next, as we go back to the basics. Like it's basic, but oftentimes the basic is the important. Pray, Father, I thank you for this moment. We also thank you for uh, known Victory Church, Victory Church on the Rock, almost 30 years as a church. Almost 30 years. We thank you that you are building your church. We thank you that you've changed our lives. And God, we, we don't take that lightly. And so God, today we dedicate ourselves to sharing our story and sharing your love and making you known in our city. Make you known wherever we go. God, we just pray for our finances as a church. We pray for breakthrough. God, we pray for those people who have yet to call our church home. God, I pray that you start to call them home. And God, we pray that we, you help us steward everything we have well. Help us love well. Help us be just so desperate to see people come to know you. And God, I pray for every single person right now who calls uh, Known Victory Church home. God, I just pray for your love to just meet them where they are, wherever they're going through, the fear, the pain, whatever. God, meet them there and help us as a church be there for one another in our darkest and hardest moments. And God, we thank you that you are building your church and the gates of hell will not prevail. In Jesus' name, amen.